Good evening, everybody. I'm so happy to be here tonight uh, because I love the practice so much and I have three children and, uh, and I know how hard it can be to be a parent and how wonderful the practice can be to do with children and to support me as a parent. So I feel uh, so much um, respect and gratitude to every single parent. Because <laughs> you, you have no idea how much work it is to work all day from the moment you wake up until you go to bed and then often in the night too. <laughs> And then the next morning, it starts again. There's, there's no break. <laughs> it's incredible how much we give to our children and how, uh, how challenging it is because they're changing all the time. And, um, yeah, so I'm so happy you're here and, and learning this practice. Hmm. So when my son was about a year and a half, uh, I thought to myself, hmm, this isn't really how I imagined it would be. <laughs> I had imagined it being just like glorious, uh, dwelling in the present moment with my child. and. Um, what I realized is I had learned how to practice mindfulness in the monastery and for many years, so I, I knew it deep inside very well. But this little person of a year and a half, he, I didn't know anything like that in the monastery. He just moved so fast, like all day long, <laughs> and uh, had so much energy. And I didn't know how to drop in to my mindfulness practice with him. Um, so I felt, I felt something was missing. Mm. And I realized I needed to train myself to, to create an internal uh, experience of what that's like to be deeply present with my child. So. And it was very important to me. So what I did is I set up a schedule during the week and I picked times that would be my training times, uh, especially things that would happen regularly. And one of the main ones was getting ready for bed at night. Mm. And I approached it as seriously as I would a sitting meditation. So it wasn't just something I was sort of trying to be mindful while doing other things. That was all I was doing. It was my serious practice time. So we would go up to the bathroom and um, what we did outwardly, the first thing I did was I created this little uh, hand washing practice because I also wanted to have fun with it. And I wanted to offer him an experience of the beauty of life that I felt. And I didn't quite know how to do that, so I started exploring, how can I do that? What are some ways I can do that? So I would light a candle in the bathroom, and I got like a, a little basin, and I got a clear picture, pitcher, and filled it with warm water. And I put some little stones in the basin, and then I would have him come over and I would pour the water over his hands, like really slowly. So he could really feel the water, really have this slow experience of, of the beauty of life in that moment, of the water of his own hands. And I would talk quietly about how the water, this water used to be in a cloud and it rained down on the earth and it ran in the streams 
and it feeds all the trees. And right now it's, it's washing your hands. And then I would let him just play in the water until he was done, and then we would move on to brushing teeth. Mm. So I kind of outlined what I'm actually doing internally, what my intention was internally while that's happening. So as soon as I would come to the bathroom, I would start my practice. Like when you sit on your cushion, you start your practice. And so the first part was just stopping. So letting go of the day, letting go of any other projects, things I'm worried about, lists of things to do. I just drop them. And I would come back to my body and my breath to anchor myself in that moment. And that would take a little bit of time, more time sometimes, <laughs> depending on how much I had going on up in my head. And once I settled down into my body and had some space inside, then I would concentrate on the beauty of life and allow myself to feel that connection, usually like with the sunlight coming through the window or the, the sounds of the wind, or just really noticing what is the quality of life in this moment and allowing myself to be nourished by that. So this is basic mindfulness practice, really, like we're doing often, mm, coming into the present moment. And once I was really grounded, then I would turn my attention to my child, to Lorian. And one of the things I noticed really quickly was that I had already built a little box around who I thought he was by the time he was one and a half. Like, I already had a lot of ideas about him. And uh, so I would start by sort of becoming aware of that and like stretching that box open and letting it go and looking at him like I was looking at him for the first time with fresh eyes and sort of creating an open feeling in my heart to, to see who is this little being, who is he really, and, and letting myself witness his, his true presence and just being there quietly like that. So for my practice training, that was my first intention, like to be truly present with my child and uh, to learn how to do that. And the second thing I wanted to do was to um, strengthen my deep listening capacity. And uh, I was amazed when I paid attention when I was quiet enough, and then with my child and listening inside, how many uh, reactions I would have. <coughs> so my child, you know, they're very enthusiastic about whatever they do. And they, they haven't always learned, you know, the, the laws of uh, physics and, or how you do things. And so, as a caretaker or a parent, I think we, we're constantly looking how to kind of keep things clean and safe and um, teach them how to do things. So I would notice he would go to fill a glass of water and it would be getting very full. And in my mind, I'd be like, I would want to say, oh, stop, turn off the water. It's getting too full. And to like move his hand and move the glass out of the way. But now I could see that. Usually I didn't see it because everything happens so fast. And so I, what I wanted to do was get quiet enough and pull myself back enough to let him have his own experience. Because for me, in my head, I'm like, keep the glass not too full because I don't want to mess. <laughs> but for him, he's like, wow, the water's filling this cup up and I'm going to try to carry it and take a sip out of it. It's like he's having a, an experience of wonder or like learning something new. It's like he hasn't had that many experiences. So each new experience, and I think this happens all the way through when they're teenagers, 
it's really important and, and deep for them. Mm. And so I was able to train my thinking. So instead of quickly jumping to correct or control the situation, instead to pull back, unless it was really dangerous, and I had to feel that, that line, and instead cultivate a feeling of trust in him, and, and really reverence for, and respect for what he was going through, and allowing him space to, to do that. And also to, to, uh, to really listen to what he was saying. Because <laughs> often we don't hardly hear what they're saying. We just, in our mind, are like, all right, it's 10 minutes late. We, we have to get our teeth fresh so we get to bed on time. And kind of the day can kind of move like that constantly. We're always trying to get them somewhere or accomplish something. And we don't really hear what they're saying. We're kind of moving next to each other, but not really meeting. Hmm. So, this was an incredibly powerful experience. Within like three days, my relationship with him really changed. And uh, first of all, this, this, this warmth grew in my heart, this deep love, because I was allowing myself the time to love him, to see him, to see the real wonder that he is. And, um, and a trust grew between us. Because I could listen to him, he trusted me more. Trusted that I would react, in, I would act in a way that was respectful to him. So he wasn't always trying to like push, he didn't need to push so hard to, to be respected in what he was going through. And, uh, I remember the, the moment I really noticed it. The house we lived in had a really narrow entryway where all the shoes were. And often if we were going through there, we were trying to get somewhere on time. <laughs> and children just don't try to get places on time. Like every, every step of the way is like amazing to them and they just want to stay there. So just getting their shoes on and their coat or whatever, it could be really stressful because they're trying to do one thing and I'm trying to rush them to another. So we had a lot of uh, temper tantrums in that little <laughs> entryway. And um, yeah, after a few days, I was, we were going through there and it was a very different experience. Because I had created this feeling of deep connection with him, I naturally didn't just push him along. I had a new sort of tendency, which was to feel how he was doing and listen to the little cues he was giving, what he was going through. And I could take just a little bit of a pause to let him be where he was. And then he trusted me, so I noticed when I did move him, it was like he connected with me and we moved together instead of trying to resist, resist me. So the moving was, is much more easy. And uh, so this experience has stayed with me since then. Uh, sometimes I call it dropping into presence. Like once I, I knew how to drop into presence with a, you know, a child that's maybe moving very fast <laughs> or having strong emotions, like once I knew what that felt like in my thinking, in my body, then I could just do it at all different times. And uh, he's 13 this month, and uh, I still do that practice with him. Like at night, I go and sit on the edge of his bed, and it's the same feeling. I just drop into myself, and I open up to listen what he, what he wants to share that day, and to reflect this uh, respect to him.
So there are so many uh, different ways that we can do this practice. And what I really like to do with all of my practice is, if possible, connect the practice with something I like to do or something fun, because then I'm much more likely to do it. <laughs> like uh, my partner and I, we do beginning anew um, and also take time to reflect on the family. We try to do it every week, Friday night, and people know it as date night. But the first half of our date night is always beginning anew and connecting and sort of dharma sharing and reflecting on the kids. And then we get to go out to dinner or go for a hike or uh, go listen to music or whatever it is that brings us joy. So I put the two together and then there's double motivation. Because <laughs> if I'm tired at the end of the week, and then we're going to do beginning anew, I might find an excuse. <laughs> Too tired. But when you attach it with something that really is easy to be nourished by, it helps you to do the, find, take the time to do that other kind of nourishment. Mm. So, so I, found I found lots of different moments in my daily life. I'm uh, always looking and being creative and how can I bring the practice in? Sometimes people who are studying the mind now, they talk about the mind as a forest with pathways through it. And uh, those are the ways our minds, each of us is different, just naturally goes. And the pathways we walk a lot are very easy to go down. And then the, the ones that we've never walked or we rarely walk, they become overgrown. And so even if at a certain moment we're like, I want to be mindful now. If we never walk that path, it's going to be all overgrown and we're going to slip back into the easy path, which is our normal way of reacting. So, first of all, what I was doing in that exercise was creating the path. I didn't know how to get there. I wanted to be a mindful parent, but I didn't know how to get there. So I had to slowly create it intentionally, find my way to that experience. And also, once you have a path, you have to keep walking it, otherwise it, it becomes overgrown. So if we want to bring this practice into our life, we really have to take the time. Create time in your, your weekly schedule, in your daily life, where you practice it, and then it's something you can access at all different times. Mm. So, for example, one of the things that we like to do in our family is uh, go on bike rides. So we'll, we'll pick a place, we'll go with all our bikes, and then we'll, we'll take a, a long bike ride together. And uh, I choose that as one of my practice moments. So as soon as I sit on the bicycle, I do that. I start with letting go, so letting go of what happened earlier, what's happening tomorrow, coming back to my body, noticing the world around me, and then just really enjoying the world around me and my children. And they don't, they have no idea I'm practicing. That's one of my, like, staple practices. But it, um, it keeps my practice alive because I often, it's hard to find time for sitting when you're a parent. So these, these moments are really important for my own nourishment. Because I also, I need to have time when I'm, when I have space inside, when I relax, when I let the nourishment of life come in. And as parents, especially, we're so busy, there's not a lot of that space there. So if you can put times in, for us it's often uh, Sunday afternoons, I go for bike rides. Hmm. So it creates a time. We can create these times for our own practice. Uh, and it also teaches the practice to the children, although they don't know it, but in the best way. Because if they grow up being around 
people who know how to be at ease, who know how to be happy, who, when they look in your eyes, they can tell when you're present or you're not. I can, I can tell right away the way they react when I look at them. If I'm really there, they feel it and they settle down. If I'm not really there, they keep kind of buzzing around me, kind of anxious, <laughs> like I'm buzzing around inside. Yeah, so if, they, if you know how to be really there, at least some of the time, that will grow in them. So you give this direct transmission, which is uh, easier for them to get than talking to them about it. Yeah. It also uh, makes it so you don't miss probably one of the happiest times of your life, maybe. Because uh, it's so rich and full, and I think when you get old and you look back, that time that you got to live together as a family will be one of the most wonderful times, and it's easy, I think, to kind of miss it. It's so busy. So I feel the sense of peace that I'm not missing this. Because when you let go of everything and you're really there, you feel this deep satisfaction of, I'm really living my life, and I'm really living it with my children, and we're having a good time together. Mm. What I found it also does is that that sense of trust that t the child gets when you can really listen to them, really see them, and not just be reacting to them right away, that trust that you can, can hear them, is something that I think is really helpful, especially as they grow older and move into being a teenager. And I've heard uh, many other people say that too, if you can establish a strong connection when they're younger, then it'll be easier for them to come to you and feel supported as they go into those teenage years that can be so challenging. Yeah, and actually you can cultivate that even once they're teenagers already because they'll feel it right away. It might take you a little while. You might have the intention and then you start judging them. <laughs> so but after a little while you'll get used to that feeling of just, just witnessing and accepting them. Sister, I'm wondering, is there a clock somewhere? But you need your clock. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Good. So, I'd like to take a moment uh, to reflect on this in our own lives. Because I feel like when I'm in a retreat, the more I, uh, if I at least a few times look, look out into my life at home while I'm nice and calm and see how I might want to change a few things to, to bring greater quality to my life, it's really helpful. Because once I get home and get busy, it's harder to see that. So I thought we could take a moment to uh, do a very short little meditation right now. And you have some paper, and you also have some cards. So something I really like to do is use these little cards and write myself notes. Like I'll meditate, and I'll have an insight. I'll look into some part of my life, I'll have an insight. And then I write it on the card. And when I go home, I put it up on my wall. <laughs> if I write it and it just stays in a pile somewhere, it's easy to forget. So I put it up here, there, someplace I see it often, so I don't forget how important that is, and it helps me to do it. Um, so let's uh, come back to our body, our breathing. Feeling our body, inviting our body to be at ease. 
to relax. Coming back to ourselves. Coming back to a quiet space inside. And now looking over your daily life with your family. Looking to see where you might be able to create one of these practice moments that you can use to train yourself and then to keep your practice alive with your children. And if you don't have children, (laughs) just with yourself. And when you're ready, if you want to take a few notes or draw a picture, something to remind you, you can do that. I'm taking a moment to finish up for now. You can listen to a sound of the bell.
So earlier today we started to learn about seeds, seeds in our consciousness. And uh, I've made up a story for myself about my grandmother uh, to help me understand the seeds that are in our, our consciousness. So some of the seeds are being watered today, yesterday, when we were children. So if we see we have a, a quality, we might be able to look back and see where that came from. Or if we have a suffering, we might be able to look back and see where that came from. And then there are many seeds, and sometimes we don't even know they're there, that came from hundreds of years ago. <laughs> yeah, the collective experience. And so I like to, uh, to make it concrete for myself. I imagine that my grandmother may have worked at an inn, uh, set, working in the dining area. And sadly, the innkeeper wasn't a very happy person. They had suffered a lot. And uh, the innkeeper liked everything to be the way she liked it. So the tablecloth had to be just so perfect. And if my grandmother didn't do it quite right, the innkeeper would get upset and scold her. And the innkeeper liked her hair to be pulled back really tight. So no one thought they were getting hair in their food and it looked very tidy. So she always had to make sure her hair was very tightly pulled back. And when she got upset, the innkeeper, and would yell at my grandmother, there was this deep, certain voice that would come out, and my grandmother would feel sort of terrified and, and pain inside. Yeah. And so then she would go home and have her daughter set the table. And when her daughter would uh, put the tablecloth on and it was a little crooked, my grandmother would, this uh, feeling of pain and anxiety would rise up in her. And she can't do it like that, you have to do it just so. It has to be just so. And I think all of us know this experience. Maybe not with the tablecloth, but other things around the house. How the sink is cleaned, or where the toothbrushes go, or... <laughs> all these little details that we can get so upset at each other about. And we don't even realize that they, they were a transmission somewhere. There's some reason behind them. But it can create suffering between us because when that tablecloth isn't right, the suffering comes up. And when my grandmother and my mother would go to town, if my mother's hair wasn't all tight, just so, my grandmother would feel nervous and tell her she had to keep her hair just so. And when they were walking around in town, maybe in a shop, and my grandmother would hear this certain voice, she would become very anxious and afraid and feel pain in her. And she would grab my mother's hand and, and leave the shop. And so my mother learned all these things, not without any reasoning. She just learned when I hear that voice, it's dangerous and I need to leave. It's not safe. Yeah, I feel. And she learned her hair has to be just so or it's not okay. And if she found herself in town at some point and her hair was kind of wild, she might suffer, you know, feel very anxious. Mm -hmm. And then I came along and I get the same transmission and no idea why. So does that seed belong to me? Is it my fault that I get anxious if my hair isn't just so, or when I hear a certain voice? It doesn't really belong to me. It's old. And some of them are really, really old. These seeds that we live with, these seeds of suffering, of fear, of judgment, 
of uh, not feeling good enough, all these seeds that have been given to us. And that innkeeper, who knows, maybe they suffered because my great-grandfather did something to her. <laughs> At any rate, it came from a collective moment, you know? Something in her life happened, maybe a war, or just a, a tragedy. It didn't belong to her, her suffering. The innkeeper's suffering wasn't hers either. She's not the original source. It's all shared. And sometimes uh, it's more individual, and, and a lot of these seeds are collective, the way our society looks at life. It's been formed out of these old experiences. And we learn this is what we should be afraid of, this is what should be most important, this is what we spend our time doing, all these things. And then we just live with them, like that's how it has to be. Yeah. So that's really, really helpful for me. I like to uh, think about all these seeds as belonging just to the collective garden of humanity. And humanity has had all these experiences for thousands of years, and it's created seeds of suffering and seeds of joy and seeds of creativity and uh, intelligence and love, pain, violence. There's this big garden. And then I see each one of us, it's like we have a basket of them. That we got a certain basket. But it doesn't, it's not my basket, it's just the basket that I, I have. That's part of the whole, whole garden. And if I, if I think like this, it really helps me not to judge people, but to be curious about them. Curious what seeds are in your basket and what seeds are in your basket. Not feeling that they're yours or mine, but what's in our basket is sort of our uh, treasure that we get to work with, our part of humanity's growing, that we get to work on uh, transforming and enjoying. Yeah. And I think, for me, that's been especially helpful as a parent, because uh, I am amazed how much my ancestors are parenting my children. <laughs> that if, you, if I sat there and told you what I believe should happen, it's one thing, and then what comes out of my mouth <laughs> can be something quite different, you know? Because it just, the seeds went in, and I didn't see them my whole life until I had children. And then they come out, and I, I talk in a certain way. Uh, and it's hard, it's hard to change that, but we can. But uh, it's easy for me to feel judgmental, to be hard on myself, because I'm not as beautiful as a, of a parent as I would like to be. Yeah. But clearly, uh, we can't judge ourselves. We didn't choose uh, those seeds, otherwise they would be all wonderful. <laughs> and it's really a, sort of a noble task that we take up certain seeds of suffering, and we love them, and we find ways to open them to a new experience, so we don't live with that fear or that anger, so it doesn't dominate our life. But uh, we have to be patient. There was a certain moment when I suddenly realized I'm not going to transform all these seeds. And it, it was very distressing until I sat with it and, and came to just realize that's how it is. There are too many deep seeds in me and I'm not going to be able to only transmit well-being to my children. I can do my best, but I'm also going to transmit some suffering and that's okay. The wonderful thing is the Buddha taught, and uh, now they're finding in uh, all their studies of the brain, is that consciousness is very organic. Nothing needs to stay that way forever. Just a few days ago I was hearing on the radio how they're finding that only really simple 
feelings, just a couple of them, are, uh, they are uh, authentic. And it's interesting because it's basically what the Buddha taught. There's pleasant and unpleasant. And then there's like heightened energy and low energy, something like that. And then all of our other emotions are created from the time we're little. We were taught them to have these different emotions. And she was sharing how you can change that. Even with really strong emotions, you can re, you can learn a new way. So for me, that's very exciting. That, and I think as parents, we should try to have fun and enthusiasm in what we can transform and what we can offer our children. And then don't beat ourselves up when, when only like a tenth of it manifests. Because we live in a society and, uh, and it's hard to swim against the stream. And it's hard to transform, but it is, it's possible if we give it some attention and creativity. I'd like to invite uh, two sisters to come sing a beautiful song that Sister Tania wrote about this. No guitar. No. Dear beloved community, um, the song is called Watering Seeds of Joy. And it's about um, seeds that are being transmitted by our ancestors. Oh, that's right. The words are on the back of your song sheet. It 
to preserve, develop and nourish seeds of understanding, seeds of love, seeds of freedom which they have transmitted to me. In my daily life I also want to sow seeds of love and compassion in my own consciousness in the heart of other people. I am determined not to water the seeds of craving, aversion, and violence in me. I am determined not to water the seeds of craving, aversion, and violence in others with resolve and with compassion. I give rise to this aspiration. May my practice be an offering of the heart. May my practice be an offering of the heart. I want to share a, a little bit more about seed watering and the, and the, how we can bring the fifth mindfulness training to our children. When my son was about that age, uh, I went to a lecture by a, a man named Kim Payne, and um, he had worked with refugees in Asia somewhere, and he was working with the children who were uh, dealing with post-traumatic stress. And he did that, that beautiful work for a while, and then he came back to the West, and he started working with children in the West. And he discovered that a lot of the symptoms that the children in the refugee camps were having also the children in the West were having. And he was very curious about this. And uh, he thought about it and he realized it was because the children in the West were experiencing so much stress on a regular basis. And it was a, a more low level stress, but the way our lives have evolved, it was kind of constant low level stress that the children were receiving. And so he, he thought about their lives and where they may be receiving stress. And sometimes stress is very subtle, especially in children, because their senses are new. You know, like if we have a, some kind of violent music in the background, or music that's too loud, even as an adult, it can slowly make you feel stressed, because that's coming into you. Uh, but there are many, many levels like that. And so he looked at their lives and then he formed a picture of what, it, what their lives might be like if they reduced that stress in these different areas. 
And so he started working with families in that way. Uh, especially, of course, the children that came were children that may have been labeled with ADHD or some sort of, you know, they were exhibiting um, behavioral challenges, um, as well as children that had less of that. And uh, he went through their life, and so some of the things he looked at were um, media. Like, media is a lot for a child to take in. There's a lot of stimulation and uh, messages about life that's pouring into them. Especially media that has violence, but even any media, it's kind of stimulating. And he looked at noise. What's the background noise in the house? Is the TV always on or the radio? And he looked at uh, stuff. <laughs> and that's a wonderful thing in the monastery. You know, the, the, the monastics I've known for a long time. That simplicity and space is soothing. Soothing for the human being. But now, especially in the West, we have an overabundance of stuff. And especially our children get an overabundance of stuff. Yeah, because people give it to them, or they see the advertising and they want it. And it's so cheap now. So it just keeps coming into the house. And pretty soon their whole space is cluttered. Hundreds of books and toys and things. And that's a subtle kind of stimulation that they're getting. This clutter, this, all those things are kind of calling to them for attention. It's a very different experience if you imagine taking all those things out of a room and just giving them a few really simple things. And he did lots of experiments with this. A few simple things to play with that spark their imagination and their creativity. And they just, they can breathe, they can settle down. And so he, uh, he, part of this working with the families was a black bag day. And he would come to the house and help them get rid of, I forget how much, but like 60 or 70 percent of their stuff would go into black bags and just give the children some space. Mm -hmm. And uh, adult conversation. He, he worked with the parents to reduce the amount of adult conversation because often adults are uh, you can be agitated with each other, arguing, or talking about things in the news or work that you're worried about. You know, we just have all this conversation in front of the children now, and they, they don't really quite know how the world works yet. So when you say something, they don't know how to put it into context yet. Like, is that really a dangerous situation? Do I really need to worry about what mommy and daddy are talking about? You know. Are we not going to have enough? Things like that. Of course, if, if there's something you really need to look at as a parent, you talk about that. But there's a lot of things that we, we just talk about and we know have the context for it. And for the children, that's creating stress. That's watering seeds of worry about life, about their family. And so he invited them to have less of that kind of conversation from the children, which is exactly what we talk about in the five, the fifth mindfulness training, being aware of the conversations we have with people. And if that helps us have more happiness or becomes a real leak of our energy, brings us down. Mm. And uh, he invited them to simplify scheduling. A lot of us have heard this, I think. <laughs> Because he, he found the children had this packed schedule. The parents wanted to give them so many things. So they were just running after school to this activity and that activity. And what he realized is that um, children didn't have childhood anymore. They didn't have space. And that children really need space. Like they learn a lot. They, because everything is new to them. And then they need time to integrate that, ex the experience they have, like especially at school. There's a lot going on and what they're learning in the social interactions. And I think most of us know that because when we pick them up, they, sometimes they might fall apart because they're stressed. You know, they just absorb a lot in the day. And they need time, you know, 
some time in the day where there's nothing going on. So they can relax, so they can integrate in their own way what they just experienced. If it's constantly coming in, school, activity, TV, sound, music, blah, blah, and they go to bed, you know. They can't rest, and they become anxious, and they become uh, aggressive. See, they're too full. We have the same thing. If we're too full, we have pretty short tempers, I think. Yeah, they need space. And the other really beautiful thing that happens when you give them space is they, they get to be in contact with themselves. That, that beautiful experience of just being with yourself and knowing what that feels like. Not what, what's being put into you, but just when you have space, how does that feel? And they, they get to know themselves. And that gives them a feeling of ease and security. If you never have a chance to really be in touch with yourself, it's kind of destabilizing. Yeah. And, uh, of course, being out in nature is a wonderful naturally healing space. So if they can have time every day outside, and if they can't, just at home with no stimulation, just quiet to play, or set up a, like a baking project, something that's simple, but they can just go into their imagination and relax into, into something. So, uh, I feel like it's easy to, like if we imagine our life, it's like a river. And maybe before we had children, we knew how to manage it and we, we float along in the riverbed and then we have children. <laughs> and we start getting busy and it's like, it's all so much that the, our life starts to, the water starts overflowing the bed and going everywhere and destroying things. Yeah. So as parents, this practice of uh, simplifying. It's really a, like a gesture of protection. Yeah. It's like creating the banks on the river. You don't just let everything happen how it happens to happen and overflow into chaos, because that, that's really hard for children. But we make a little effort to create a bank. Yeah. Something that doesn't just let everything come in, protect them there. So this is, uh, this is also in the direction of uh, protection, protection from negative seed watering. That's a lot of, uh, that happens a lot with media these days. So being aware that whatever the children are experiencing is coming in to their consciousness and touching some seed in there. And I remember a long time ago going with Tai to visit um, Robert Thurman at Columbia. And up on his wall he had this picture of the brain, like 10 pictures or something. And it showed what happened to the brain when it watched TV and more and more TV. And its activity went from the kind of creative, connecting, engaging part of the brain down to the, you know, the repti reptilian, is that what they call it? Part, which is all about protection and fight or flight. And you can't be very creative, and you're certainly not at ease. And the more TV that was being watched, the more that other part of the brain was growing, this part that, that feels uh, life is dangerous. Yeah. There's lots of other amazing things they've discovered, but the basic thing that they're finding is it's just really healthy for children to not have too much screen time. So other parts of their being and their capacity to engage in life and be interested in life grows. Yeah. So being aware of what's coming in for our child, what's, what's being watered, what's growing, and protecting and it's not easy to protect, it's very hard. You have to really be like a bodhisattva warrior. 
to bring up some courage because society is all going in the opposite direction. You need more of this and more of this and more of this. And it can be sort of, um, it looks easy. And I discovered this at one point <laughs> when we tried it because we were very busy. It's kind of like a natural babysitter. You have to let them go on the screen and they really want it. So first of all, you get a benefit, so that's tempting, because then you can get some work done in quiet. And the second is they really want it, so you have to make this effort to hold that boundary for them. So it's not easy, and their friends all, Mommy, my friend, my, my nine-year-old is always saying, all my friends are, I've seen this movie. And then I'll say, oh, which ones? And she'll say, well, I said, did Emma see it? No, Emma didn't see it. It's like one or two, or I'll ask the parents, did you guys really let you know them see this PG-13 movie or whatever? And no. <laughs> but they have this feeling like everyone, sometimes they do, but also the children have the impression that everyone else is doing this, and therefore they have to do it. So it takes, it takes a lot of... Um, real dedication. And what I found is when I limited, when we let the children have more media, at a certain point when we were very busy, they were, they were getting more and more agitated. And it was going up and up, and I didn't realize what it was. And then I was like, oh, I think we need to stop the media. Because <laughs> it seemed like they were having so much fun, but their quality of interaction and play was going down. And what they started doing is they were always looking for when they could have it. Can I play a video game? Can I? And every moment was like wanting that. It's like a little addiction. And they actually, that's what they've discovered. These games, they stimulate things in the children and it becomes an addiction. <clears throat> so then we pulled back on the media and after a couple of days they settled back down. And I was so relieved. <laughs> it was the media. It's kind of easy, easier to fix. But uh, they learn how to play on their own. It doesn't take too long. There's like a little withdrawal, like with any addiction, and then they settle down. And so when, in our family we have certain moments, you know, and I try to pick the, the things that are not too negative. But I mean now there's so many wonderful types of media out there that we can choose from. So if they're going to have a media, it's kind of a special thing movie night and we pick one of these wonderful things to watch with them. So protection and then really being creative and, and uh, intentional to water the positive seeds because they're so sensitive and it's amazing when they get older and they'll say, oh that story made a real impression or that person like the things you give them are growing something in them. So whether it's the books, I love to play the uh, the Plum Village music in the background because that's just gently. Well, first of all, it calms me down. <laughs> so I usually put it on at dinner time when I'm a little tired and the kids are a little tired. I put on the Plum Village CD and it helps me to calm down. But it's also it's nourishing them. It's nourishing in them this idea that that they can have joy and ease in their life, which they're not hearing from many other places. You know. And I, I also take bedtime. Bedtime is one of the times I, I practice a lot with the children because they're calm and because I've chosen that as another one of, of my times that I drop into presence. And the first thing I do is listen listen to them a little bit, and then I invite them to, to be quiet and settle down for sleep, and I might light a candle. And then I can do some positive uh, seed watering. And there's lots of different ways I wrote about it on that paper, so... I might do a, a guided meditation, or tell a story, or sing, practice songs. Michael, it's fun because our children are different rooms, so I get to hear him and he gets to hear me. He often sings uh, the practice songs in French because he learned them in French and in English. 
Um, or sometimes I just water their flower. I appreciate them. So, flower watering, he, uh, our brother started to talk about that today. It's when you're intentionally growing something. And uh, if you're doing it person to person, it's usually appreciating them. It's very powerful. I can see sometimes my children are kind of, they're like a limp flower. <laughs> they're not feeling very well. And I just do a little bit of flower watering and they start to perk up. <laughs> really uh, gives them a lot of energy. But what I discovered is uh, it's not only the words, especially as a parent, but it's how I think about the children. What I think about them is watering flowers. It's like if you walk into a room and there's someone there who really doesn't trust you, they, they really don't like you, you can kind of, you can feel it. And that that touches that seed in you of insecurity, you know, whatever they're thinking, their negative things, it touches that. As opposed to if you walked into a room and someone loved you so much, they had so much confidence in you, they really appreciated you. Even if they didn't talk to you, but they just looked your way, you can feel what's reflected in that, their eyes. And with the children especially, the boxes we put in them into, the things we think about them, it's touching. It's touching these seeds in all kinds of little ways, in the way we react, the way we talk, the way we... the things we suggest they do or don't do. So I like to take time in my, in my sitting. I try to do it once a week or once every couple of weeks. It's not always my whole sitting, but just a little bit of time to uh, go through my family and water their flowers in my own thinking. So I keep, I keep that reflection of them alive for them. And then I can keep seeing these beautiful things in them even when they lose sight of it and keep touching them. So I wanted to uh, end today with doing uh, a guided meditation like that for our children. Um, we will spend part of the meditation doing a, a flower watering and also opening our heart to, to sort of be in touch with their deepest essence, that, uh, that beautiful, loving part that's deep inside of them that's going to be unfolding throughout their lives that we know we all have. But to, to take a, time, a moment to, to feel that, to see that. And then, um, and then I'm going to invite us to look over our daily life a little bit to see where they struggle and maybe where we can support them. So for me, in my meditation, I, uh, there's quite a few different kinds of practice I do, but I also, part of it is to be very practical. So I like to look at my life and ask, how is my happiness? How is my suffering? What's happening? And then, what can I do to work with that? So that I am the, the creator, the artist of my life. And I'm, uh, I'm watching it. And the same we can do with our children. When we're quiet in meditation, we can see how, how are they doing, what do they need. And when we're quiet like that, we can see a little more deeply. So we'll do that tonight, and it, it may or may not be fruitful, <laughs> but at least we'll, uh, we'll start to feel what that's like, and we can take that home with us, that kind of practice, and uh, use it, develop it. So we'll begin with the sound of the bell. Coming back to our body, feeling our body, feeling our breath in and out.
coming back to a calm, quiet place inside. And now, choosing one of your children or someone you love to bring to mind. And what is it that you love about them? And just allowing things to arise. What is it that they like to do, that they're good at? Seeing them, remembering when they're happy, when they're joyful, laughing. When are they happy? When are they content? and peaceful in themselves. When are they excited about life? and really feeling our appreciation of them. Now, opening ourselves to see their deeper nature, their fullest self, their quality, their inner nature that's filled with love and well-being. and feeling gratitude for their presence in our life. And now, looking over their daily life and seeing if there are areas where they struggle What does that struggle look like?
And now listening to see if we can hear what is it they really need. How might we be able to support them? And sending our compassion, wrapping them up in our compassion, our love, our spacious embrace. our breath Almost time to be finished. I'd like to give you just a moment in case you want to write a few things down uh, that you don't want to forget. And it could be things that you saw when you were appreciating them. Qualities that you saw or could be insights about how to support them.
So I often uh, put my insights. I make my own gata cards. You see gata cards here. We use them to remind us of the practice. So if you want, you can go to the children's room and you can uh, rewrite it with color and make a picture. <laughs> or, uh, or just put it up on your wall as it is. So you can remember. So tomorrow we'll be looking at a bunch of other things. Some of the things um, I'm hoping to talk about are the I want to talk about the, the healing power of boundaries, which is something I learned about and is very powerful with our children, as well as play. I want to look at uh, just more little practical moments that I found to bring the practice into our daily life, like uh, tea meditation and beginning anew on a child's style and um, also something that we created, which is a family council, which is helpful as they get older, creating spaces to communicate. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Michael's and my uh, weekly beginning anew and our practice of reflecting on the children and what we do during that time and being with uh, upset emotions in ourselves and in our children. So that's what we'll do tomorrow. And, um, yeah, I also want to let you know that we have retreats at uh, Morning Sun for families also. And this summer we're offering some special afternoon sessions uh, just for parents. Well, we'll do things like this and other activities and also have discussion uh, as a group of parents where you can really feel supported. And actually, we're so many parents at this retreat, so... <laughs> You probably have that in your Dharma discussion. But it's really helpful to hear that other parents suffer like we do, and also maybe hearing things they've figured out. Because one of the things I, I learned is that almost every suffering I've had with the children, there's a reason for that. And, and once you uh, realize that, and then you open yourself to learn from other adults or from people who have studied children, and it's incredible. I could s suffer a whole year, and I learned this one little thing to do differently, and it changes, changes everything. So learning from each other is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.